Hey y'all, the 6.5 diesel in my 1985 Suburban makes a little over 500 pound-feet. That's about the same as my LB7 Duramax. I'm going to go through every single system on this, fuel, air, cooling. So if you have a 6.5 diesel and you're looking to make a couple of upgrades, this is the episode for you. Now, first things first, just so you guys know what we're looking in, this is a 1985 Chevrolet Suburban. It came with a 6.2 diesel. In fact, my dad ordered it that way from the General, and this became my first car when I was about 14. And I've been piddling on it ever since. This 6.5 came from General Engine Products. They're the current manufacturer of the 6.5 for the M1114 and 16 and all the up-armored Hummers that are out there uh, still running around that need 6.5s. The most important part of getting the 6.5 from General Engine Products is that you get the forged crankshaft. Yeah. Gabe saw this, he was up there. He goes, hey, I saw a crankshaft with your name on it. It's got a double parting line. You'll know it when you see it. All those details and more are covered in the engine assembly videos. There's a two-parter and they're linked here in the description. Staying on the subject of the engine itself, the short block is balanced. With the engine from GEP, I got the latest style 6.5 cylinder heads, and there's some great reasons to have that. They have hardened valve seats, they've got better little cooling passages between the valves. The last thing I'll say about general engine assembly, I used head studs to put together the top end as well as the mains, and that they're all really nice hardware. Some people go as high as 125. If you're flowing 25 plus pounds, that seems to be the breakover point. Uh, factory would have you do about 90, uh, actually did about 105 on mine. You start with a brand new block, you make sure everything is like bored and lined and everything is nice. You just standard good engine building practices. And at the same time, what we add to it on the outside is where all the good power comes from. The engine is set up with a DB2 mechanical fuel injection pump. And this particular one is among the highest power rated units offered by Stanadyne as a factory model. It's got their largest plungers and that ends up pairing quite nicely with good high flow injectors. It flows enough to make 250 horsepower and 515 pound feet out of the box. My torque estimate is based purely on the fact that this engine burns super clean, which you can see in this clip, as I am crawling out of a very soft set of ruts with the throttle absolutely wooded. The turbo spools and the exhaust goes from that inky black to a very light gray haze. That tells me that the 6.5 is burning pretty much every drop of fuel that the injection pump is sending to the injectors. But we're gonna talk about dyno sessions and all that later in the episode. You can turn up the fuel metering screw and play a little bit with the timing to get what would conservatively be about 300 horsepower and maybe 550 pound-feet-ish. I'm really very happy with the 250 and 515, right? This is a big heavy truck and we're already taxing the cooling system a little bit. So that amount of fuel, works really well for this truck. I paired with the big injector pump are big injectors. The injectors that are on here are essentially the largest spray pattern, highest pop pressure, marine pattern, I don't know what they what they call them, but the point is that they make a nice fog or spray, very fine mist spray of fuel in the pre-cup. There are a lot of arguments as to whether bigger injectors and the same fuel pump that you've got, you know, make any sort of difference. I'm going to tell you they don't. If you have a bigger fuel pump or a turned up injection pump, marine injectors sure seem to be a necessary item in order to flow all that extra fuel. Supplying all of that fuel is a fast fuel injection systems, 100 gallon per hour fuel pump. What they did is they essentially took the Duramax pump or the base level Cummins pump and adapted it for the 6.5. When I put this together they had just come out with that 6.5 and depending on what you can maybe find on marketplace any 100 gallon per hour is going to be enough for like 99% of all the 6.5s that are out there. 100 gallon per hour is a lot and the cool thing is it comes with filters and all that sort of stuff and it keeps a nice clean water-free supply of diesel coming to the injector. Now burning all of that fuel, because it is quite a bit for a pre-chambered indirect injection diesel, you, you need a big stinking turbo, and bigger than you would think. And in my case, this is turboed and intercooled. I'm going to go through each of those components. The turbo, in this case, is a whole set HE351CW. It's modified a little bit, and it's flowing through a modified Duramax intercool. It's a takeout from, an I think, an LB7 or an LLY. Whole set made a lot of turbos for the Dodge uh, Cummins series, and, and there's a ton of them available in junkyards and secondhand. Uh, don't fall for the Chinese turbos. Get a good, real whole set. To that point, the HE351 is a factory hybrid 3540. That's the way to think of that particular turbo. It came from an 05 Dodge. It has a regular wastegate, not the variable geometry voodoo. This is really just very simple stuff. It's just good and efficient on the back end. It's got a modified from Turbo Labs America, uh, you know, output that's a little bit larger, X-Ducer, which is a the exhaust coming out of your turbos. And it's very efficient. Keeps EGTs pretty low. 
but on the front end, it has a 60 millimeter inducer. I really think that these whole sets, these takeoff whole sets, they're the right compromise uh, from like value, right? You can still find them in the junkyard for fairly inexpensive. They're very common, so parts are out there and easy to build. Lots of modifications available. And quite frankly, in terms of like the, the pressure side, the compressor side, the intake side, when you make a pound of boost, you're making not much more than a pound of back pressure. Also, I like this because it makes all the turbo sounds and that's a nice whistly, it sounds great. Let me tell you too that I really don't, but just me personally, I'm only speaking for myself, so don't at me. I, I do not love the GM series of turbos, the GM3 through 8 that came with 6.5s. I think that those were, they were outdated when they were put in, they're highly restrictive, and all they are is adding heat to your cooling system. And I think you can do yourself favors by getting into something that's much more modern, free-flowing. Regarding the intercooler, uh, it's essentially a, an LB7 LLY intercooler with like the top two or three rows cut off so that it fits in this uh, GMT 200, the square body core support. So the inlet, Viber Performance, I just basically rated their catalog of aluminum tubing and, and a bell mouth intake, and then put a Banks air filter on here that's it's actually the same one from my LB7 Duramax. And you know, you run a pre-filter on it, when I go on an off-road trip, I'll take two filters with me. You know, whenever we get to a Love's truck stop, I'll, I'll, clean, I'll clean one of those and again with sink. Now, pro tip, the shower at the Love's is actually the hot ticket for cleaning an air filter. While the filter soaks, clean off your own personal trail grit. 10 of 10 would recommend. The air oil separator is the Vibrant, their old catch case. Uh, I worked with them and we've all helped them evolve a design that made an air oil separator. There's a few different ways to do air oil separators. This, I just like Vibrant and the quality of their work. They're nice folks. And they're really well known in the hot rod field. I have two of these dash tens running to the intake to create a negative crankcase pressure using a normal crankcase depression regulator on the valve cover. And if you don't have an air oil separator, the intake air that you're sending into your intercooler will have lots of oil vapor particles and they will coalesce on the intercooler tubing and your intercooler will be doing nothing more but being an, an oil collector and you're gonna have to drain and clean that. Uh, and I've done that before <laughs> when I didn't have a good air oil separator. It's actually very difficult to clean that out. In terms of getting out all of the spent gases, turbo exits at four inches. I think actually the, the flange is four and three eighths of an inch. I basically stay at that diameter, uh, going through a combination of round and oval. Vibrant's got a deep catalog of all this fabrication stuff. You know, kind of next down to three to squiggle between the cylinder head and the frame rail. And it's uh, four inch after that little turn down basically. It was so much fun to make and it's just got a simple resonator on it so it's not droney or poppy or anything like that but it's it's not really that quiet either if i were building this exhaust again i'd try to keep it at least three and a half uh on those neck down parts but um Man, it's tight. It's really tight in there. You always have capacity with bigger. Uh, you just got to be able to package it, right? So it depends on what you got under the truck. In this case, I got a lot of junk. And so packaging the four inch was actually pretty challenging. Look, personally, I am willing to go down some very deep holes of skill development. Like all this back purge stainless exhaust welding. I love that stuff. But I should also own the fact that this is way over the top. And look, just if it happens that your Suburban doesn't have a tube farm under it or compresses the suspension to within a frog's hair of the chassis, then you could very reasonably just use standard exhaust parts. I mean, unless you're like me and it's an absolute joy to build everything custom. I have a couple of racy things on here, but they're all for cooling. The radiator is a Ron Davis two row. I think the cores are inch and a quarter long. It's it's stinking big. It's a three and a half inch radiator, three and a half inch thick. And it has two small 14 inch brushless fans, essentially the factory fan for the Corvette Z28, ZL1. Uh, it's got two of them. In this case, I've got an enormous radiator. Not only is it big, it's dual pass, meaning it passes through two times. Now that places the intake on the passenger side and the outlet on the passenger side, right? So you get a little bit of fabrication to make that work. You don't have to do all this stainless welding to make a dual pass work. Of course, I like the way the Duramax had a partially rigid coolant return, so I made a version for this. You can also do the same thing with a modified factory upper radiator hose. In fact, flipping the dual thermostat crossover is one of the cool things that the 6.5 has that makes a dual pass just a little easier to package. By the way, all of these build photos and literally hundreds more 
are in a new photo gallery on the website. Personally, I hate scrolling back through social to find a picture, and well, I figured y'all might too. I even put the charger build on there, so go take a gander at some of what came out of those deep holes I told y'all about. It also has oil coolers in it, both of them, a transmission on one side and an engine oil on the other. And then there are separate external end coolers for transmission and engine. Seriously, oil coolers, like engine and oil and transmission fluid, not intercoolers. This is what happens after a lot of coffee. Those actually come from Trite and Racing Engineering. What's pretty cool is those are, those are legit race car radiators with fans on them, and they work extremely well. On the most recent trip across Nevada, and as long as all the fans were running, as long as I had them on max, this thing was pretty comfortable. We, we even ran the AC. Something else I spent my time on after having killed one of these, uh, one of these radiators, I, I got some electrolysis, and that was a little bit of an expensive lesson but after I did that I put a coolant filter on here I actually use the filter off of a Ford 6.0 6.4 6.7 who knows one of the ones that has a filter it actually captures especially for the iron block all this little sediment I consider that thing optional but it's kind of nice knowing that every time I fold the radiator since which I think has been maybe twice it is pristine on the inside I'm telling you spick and span not a lick of junk in there and that, that's kind of nice now the final detail on here related to the cooling system is less familiar to the 6.5 world, super common in the LS world, and it's a steam tube setup. The back of these cylinder heads, if you've ever had one of these apart, you know that the back port that comes up from the block just goes to the side of the valves and doesn't really move over and all the way to the front. The, the coolant kind of can get trapped. I moved the temp sensor to the front crossover. I created a couple of capillaries using three AN stainless, all stainless stuff, to essentially let that trapped coolant vapor bypass the thermostats and come all the way to the return. So it's constantly purging vapor. I took this directly from the page of the Chevy LS engines. They have water pumps that are lower than the top of the heads and they allow the vapor to burp out that way. The engine warms up pretty quickly. What should happen, although I don't have individual sensors on there, the back cylinder should cool every bit as good as the front and side cylinders, middle cylinders. You shouldn't have these hot spots in there. So the seam tube is one part of making that system work just a little bit better. You also notice that there are two alternators on this engine. They're both CS130 105 amp alternators. I like to have both of those, not just for charging capacity, but a little bit of redundancy. I also get my tack signal off the primary alternator, the one down by the turbo. But when those brackets became rare in hen's teeth, and in fact, that's actually something that you can find linked here in this video, is the, my alternator bracket, if you do want a second one, and you have the 96 to 2000 uh, alternator setup. One of the most common questions I get is, do you make an alternator bracket or is there one for the earlier generation uh, all the way up to 95? Not that I'm aware of. I've never seen dual alternators from the factory on that earlier generation 6.5. I've only seen them on this and I'm just duplicating a factory bracket with my own little, what I think are snazzy improvements. And I don't use super high amp alternators so that I can just go replace them at parts stores. You guys have asked a lot of questions, but one of the most common has been, can I get a build sheet? You could build your own build sheet if you go and take notes on the prior at two episodes, but even then it's not gonna cover like the turbo and the injector pump and all that sort of deal. All of that I've put into one build sheet for you and the link is the very first thing in the description here. So go to that link, get your own PDF version of the build sheet and you'll have my entire recipe for this engine why didn't you just just as in air quotes why didn't you just put a cummins or a duramax or anything else in there and i answered this in the prior video but I'll, I'll i'll give a little bit more detail everything in this truck that is to say the coil over towers right here the subframe that extends all the way back to the back of the truck built around the dimensions of, the, of those Personally, I try to be careful not to mistake chance for choice. The engine, sure, it happened to break, which I'm gonna tell you it was decidedly inconvenient, but look, I didn't have plans or parts for a swap anywhere close to ready. And by this point, the chassis was built around the dimensions of this particular powertrain. But let's be honest, sometimes chance helps. And in this case, when I found out the GEP put a forged crank in the 6.5, the choice was pretty clear. When the 6.2 broke in this and I needed to be able to uh, build another engine to go run the Washington BDR for power stop, I think I had six weeks. My dad and I had six weeks to buy, machine, build, and install an engine. And I could have gone and gotten a used 6.5 and limped it along, but I have always wanted to build what for me is like the ultimate 6.5, and that's what this is. That timeline and my willingness to kind of go down this end experiment to do something that was important to me, that's why I didn't jump to a Duramax or a Cummins. Cummins to me, I, I love the people who have done those swaps, but I've seen a hundred of them. This just isn't that truck. Candidly, I'll, I think my dad and I have talked about this, but I've never told anybody else. I won't build another 6.5, right? This is the last one. I wanted to do this as like an exercise to get the most out of it that I could. And I'm extremely happy with it. I think I might put this in other vehicles, and, but I won't build another one of these. The next question that I get asked a lot, how much did this build cost? And it is not cheap. 
I love my 6.5 and I love these engines. I think they're a, a fun design, they're easy to work on. And if you got a factory one that's running, it's relatively inexpensive to keep. But if you wanna build this from scratch, exactly the way that I did, Never mind the custom fab and all that sort of stuff, but if you just want to build from a parts perspective with all the balancing and the fuel system, you're going to need about 14 grand. You can add to that a couple of here and there's like the cooling system, the dual pass radiator that was already in there. Uh, I had a bunch of stuff from Vibrant, right? I did all this work in 2022, just building the stinking engine with all the balancing and extra parts, it was about 14. And I know, right, I'm ready for the comments where everybody's gonna say you wasted your money and all that sort of deal. Nope, I spent my money exactly the way I wanted to. I wanted to see where I could take this 6.5 with my dad. The assembly and the watch where it is, use a lot of it. Oh, if, any, if a little's good, a, a lot's better. better. And for us to see like what would be in our in our mind the ultimate version of a 6.5 and uh, we got to do that and to me that was worth every penny and then lastly uh, am I ever gonna go dyno this thing and the answer is no because those are 40 inch tires and if you've ever been on a dyno with big heavy tires like that those are about 130 pounds uh, with the wheel huge waste of time because I'm not gonna get a very useful curve out of it because there's a 4L80 and then two transfer cases and then 513s and 40 inch tires. If you know anybody in the DFW area that has a wheel dyno that will hold something that's this heavy, put them in touch with me and, and I will go do a dyno session. I'll absolutely. This is one of those builds that's never going to be done. And in fact, the day after I filmed this, the next transformation got well underway. But until then, check out the build sheet, take a look at the photo gallery, and of course, take good care.